to those who are joining us online, welcome, praise God. And so this will be part three of our little series on uh, it's time to grow up. Now you, you do understand that there has to be balance in a church uh, service. You can't have the same thing every week. I mean, for example, you know, I presume all of you are saved, right? I presume all of you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So can you imagine a group of believers, right? Everybody's saved, everybody's born again, a group of believers, but yet the message week after week after week was on how to get born again. Eventually be like, okay, listen, I'm born again, I'm saved, I need to grow now. I need to learn how to grow and develop, and I, I need something else. Well, that's what I'm talking about. So there has to be a balance, and I have found the best thing the best thing for me is just follow the leading because I don't know what's going on in everybody's world right now. I don't know what's happening in your mind and in your heart. I don't know the diagnosis you may have received or are going to receive. I sure didn't expect to wake up with the sinus uh, situation. But rebellious sinuses, man. I wanted to pop myself in the nose and drain it myself. <laughs> I said, come on. But, you know, nothing like a good night's sleep. And my wife made some uh, hot chicken, uh, fresh soup last night, so that was good. Uh, but praise the Lord. So the Holy Spirit knows what's best, obviously. But part of my job is to establish you as well. I mean, yes, I have to oversee the church, uh, but we do have to establish you in the faith. We have to teach. Uh, I love to preach. You know that. I love when the anointing hits me. And man, I'll tell you, it just looks like I come unglued up here. I love that. Uh, but if we came unglued every service, well, we wouldn't have a chance to establish you in the faith, would we? We would just be hooting and hollering. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we ought, to, we ought to do more hooting and hollering, especially with all the uncertainty in the world right now, because Jesus is still Lord. And uh, I had an interesting phone call. I get all kinds of interesting phone calls. You'd be, you'd be amazed what my week consists of. Some of you would probably cry and say, oh, my God, we had no idea, this poor guy. Um, I don't want any sympathy, of course. I do need your prayers. But it's interesting because it's been coming up more, the end time theme, uh, and that's what we're going to think about here in just a moment. But, uh, but the question had to do with, um, you know, you keep saying, me, you keep saying we're going to be raptured out of here before it gets really bad. And, and I do. I say that, don't I? Um, I believe the scripture teaches that. Uh, but I never said that we weren't going to experience more difficulties before we left. And so there, it, was a, it was a conversation for clarification. And I said, here's the thing. We are accustomed to a certain level of comfort in this country, aren't we? We don't like to be inconvenienced. You know, and I think I shared this story with you when I was in Bible college uh, 30 years ago. Can you believe this was my 30th uh, home going? My, graduate, my graduating class went back to Tulsa and I didn't go. Um, Obviously, we had little granny passing, and it was more important that, you know, that I stay here with my family and all. Uh, but I remember when I was in Bible college, uh, two of the students in my class were from Russia. And, and in the grocery store, they literally wept in the grocery store because they said, we have everything, not just one of everything. We have multiple, uh, you know, how many different brands of peanut butter. And, and, and they had said, we have to wait. We have to sometimes all day long for a loaf of bread. And here you go into any grocery store in this country and you don't have one type of peanut butter or one type of bread. And it really is an amazing thing, but it's got us accustomed to living a certain way. And you know, rightfully so, because a terrible price has been paid to maintain, to purchase that and to maintain it. Um, so, you know, we want to be very careful about having this attitude uh, that, you know, um, ow, gee, um, I'm too hot or I'm too cold and I'm uncomfortable, so I'm not going to go to church because the weather's too cold. Well, you know, there are people right now in different parts of the country who wished they had what you have right now. Um, and depending on who you talk to, talk to the Christians over there in Ukraine, um, you think they're going through something more difficult than you or I ever have in this country? Absolutely. Uh, this is not the first time that Christians have had it rough, uh, and it won't be the last time. I mean, Jesus did say these are the things that have to happen, uh, but, you know, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've deprived it of power to harm you. In the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your pain, and in the midst of torment and difficulty, 
you find the value of your faith. You find the measure of your faith and you realize that greater is he that is in you than anything else going on in your world. Anything else. And you never really know what you have in you until pressure is applied. And I'm sorry, it is just that way. Not everybody wants to hear that, but I think the Christians, the body of Christ in America, need to know that. You know, and, and the reason why, those of us who cry out for more, those of us who hunger and thirst for more, those of us who want to see more miracles, signs, and wonders, and the reason we don't is because we have Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have other options. We have other options. You know, and I was told by someone who, who saw it firsthand that in, uh, in different parts of the world, they routinely, the believers routinely, pray people back to life who died prematurely. They routinely do that. Well, I, I've not seen that to that level, have you? I mean, we have a certain way that we do things here. You know, and I'm, I'm not slighting that. I'm not looking down at that. I'm just saying that we are accustomed to things being done a certain way. And so uh, this morning, yes, <clears throat> I do believe things are going to get more challenging. I do believe that. And this is a, this is a very concerning time right now. I mentioned the military families. They don't know what their loved one's going to have to do, where they're going to be sent, what's going to happen. We don't know. I mean, right now, this is, this is, uh, this is really wacky, as I said before. And it's really sad to see this. So I think I'm going to be able to shed some light on some things today for you. Uh, and I want, what I want to do is uh, I want to take you, oh, let's see here. I, I left three different versions of the Bible up here. Uh, let me start with King Jimmy, and let me take you all the way over. Let's go to Isaiah 14, okay? So that's in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. You want to go right after Job, Psalms, and Proverbs, Song of so Songs or Song of Solomon, and you want to go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah Chapter 14. Now, part of the problem is that many Christians do not understand um, the basics. We think we do, but we don't understand the basics. You know, what happened in the Garden of Eden? You know, uh, I've been thinking about this long and hard because I don't know about you, but I wasn't here at the beginning. You may have been. I wasn't. And, you know, I go by what I read in the Word, and I also understand that I may not understand properly, I may not really be understanding it, because, listen, we, we all come up with a mindset, we get taught, we get instructed, some of us get corrupted. And so you carry that through your life, and you think you understand Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, you think you understand at the beginning, all I know is at the beginning, God created. That's all I know. I don't understand too much more than that. You know, I mean, people want to argue about a Big Bang, or they want, to, they want to argue about the theory of evolution. I thought it was still a theory. Or has it been proven that it's, it's actual, factual? Evolution is the way it went down, right? No. I mean, here's the thing. I don't have anything better to offer you than this. And no one's offered me anything better than this. So I'm sticking with this. And I come to the Word and I say, Lord, I don't really understand, so I need the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I need you to help me understand this. There are people right now who are doing their very best to corrupt the simplicity of the gospel. There are people right now who are doing their very best to expose what they call false teachers. And, you know, here's the thing, it ain't your job. Your job is just to preach the gospel. Isn't that the best remedy for deception and false teaching? Just preach the truth. Don't keep pointing the fingers at people. You'll do that the rest of your life. And who are you? Who made you the po-po? <laughs> just keep putting the truth out there. And if you are not actively preaching and proclaiming the truth, then help and support those who are. And so there are some things that I've been discovering and I've been thinking and pondering, and, and that's my job, is to, is to labor in the word and doctrine for you. Did you know that? 
That's my job. That's what I do. I labor in the word and doctrine for you, and I say, Lord, show me what I need to know. Help me so that I can convey and communicate that to my body, to our church, to, to my brothers and sisters, and, and so that we can continue to grow and develop, because I do believe that God has called us together for this time, and he's made us a beacon that is set on a hill that we are going to continue to shine the light of the gospel. We're going to continue to shine the light of Pentecost, and we're going to keep preaching the truth, speaking the truth, demonstrating the truth, and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And here in Isaiah, in verse number 12 of, of chapter 14, this is Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Who are we talking about? Yeah, before he became Satan, he was called Lucifer. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou, verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Well, in the King James, there's five I wills. Basically, and I wrote this down, I looked up several different translations this morning, and he is basically saying, I will raise or exalt my throne above the stars of God. The, the funny thing is, he already had a throne. He was given a throne. It wasn't enough for him. I'm going to raise and exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will go above the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Hmm. What does that sound like to you? Well, our last time we got together, it sounds like arrogance to me. Pride. And in verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay. We're talking about Lucifer. And we're told that pride is the condemnation of the devil. In the context in which that, Paul spoke about that, you don't promote or advance a novice lest he fall into the same condemnation as the devil, which, be, you know, pride, okay? One of, the, one of the worst things you can do is elevate somebody before they're, they're supposed to be elevated. That's one of the worst things you can do. Too much power, too much prestige, prestige worldwide, Mace. Glory to God. I don't think Mace knows that movie. No, that's probably, yeah, don't, let's not do that. <laughs> we do that in our family. We throw these one-liners out there. And, you know, name that movie. I got one for you to think about. Rabbit is good, rabbit is wise. Name that movie. Anybody? Rabbit is good, rabbit is wise. Oh, my! Bing, 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 bing. Wow! That's one of our favorites. We love that movie. Of course, we lived in Oklahoma for five years. Yeah. Wow! My sister-in-law and I, we were just talking about that. She said, nobody ever gets that line, because I was throwing these lines out there to her. And she goes, well, no one ever gets rabbit is good, rabbit is wise. I said, I got it. Russ got it. Twister. Amen. Uh, anyway, sometimes you just have to lighten things up, take a deep breath, because I'm going to drop some stuff on you here. So Lucifer had a throne, okay? Now, this is one reference, and so when we're talking about Lucifer, Isaiah 14, but the other one is <coughs> Ezekiel 28. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You want to go to Ezekiel 28. And when I lived in Oklahoma, one of the things that we had to do um, in Bible school was memorize the books of the Bible. So as I was driving to my secular job, because after I got out of class, I would drive to my secular job. That's where I learned the books of the Bible. I would take them five at a time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so I would just do that, and I had a, a, about a half-hour trip to my job. And so that's where I learned the books of the Bible, so that when I got uh, time for test time, I aced it, man. I smoked it. Yeah, baby. All the way from Genesis to Revolution. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 28. Now, this is also speaking about 
uh, Lucifer, okay? So Satan used to be known as Lucifer. He had a position. He had prestige. He had power. He had a throne. I love this. And in verse, uh, let's see, you're in Ezekiel 28. Let's begin in verse number uh, 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So Lucifer is a created being. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. You ever think about that? God created him perfect until iniquity was found in thee. Now this is Lucifer we're talking about. So where did iniquity come from? Just think about that. Just think about that. Chief, let's do this. Let's, um, let's pull up the New Living, if you would, and starting in verse number 12. Pull up the New Living there. Uh, is that the New Living right there? So, Son of Man, take up a... Okay, Son of Man, sing this funeral song for the King of Tyre. Give him this message from the Sovereign Lord. You were, watch this, the model of perfection. Mm. You were the model of perfection. You were the model of perfection. Who would not want to be the model of perfection? On display, right? Full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. Verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. And he, he lists them all out there. Um, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. Next verse. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Next one. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Now let's stop there for a minute. So God did it, right? God put evil on him. Clearly, clearly God puts evil in people. No. 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 The problem is we have people, well-meaning people, who don't understand that sometimes as you're reading the Word of God, especially in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, your Old Testament was written not in English. What was it written in? Anybody know? He Hebrew. 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 And sometimes things were translated, as they brought it on over into the English language, things were translated in the um, causative sense, God did this. God did that, God created evil, instead of permitting. Permitting. There's a big difference between allowing and permitting and then actually doing it. See, you read this and you might be thinking, well, it says right there he was blameless from the day he was created until the day evil was found in you. So he's talking about Lucifer. So God clearly put good and evil in him. God puts good and evil in all of us. No, he doesn't. No, that violates, that violates everything else that we know about creation and the fall of man and the redemption of man. See, what people need to, I, I think, more than anything, we have to come to a place when we understand that you have what's called free moral agents. Uh, you are free moral agent. You have free moral agency. God knew when he created the angels, God knew when he created man that he was giving you this power. And I wrote down, 
uh, free will, the power to self-govern, the power to self-exalt, the power to self-promote. You have that. In fact, in Jeremiah, it talks about the heart is wicked. Desperate, it's desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? So the fall of man produced something so bad, so terrible, that we couldn't just patch it over, put a Band-Aid on it, and rehab it. God had to kill that thing, that, sinful, that old sinful person that you were. But you still have the memory of it. You still have an unrenewed mind, and you still have a, a flesh that stinketh. The spirit is ruling, but the flesh is weak. And so within the heart of every man, and here's the thing that I want to, it's hard to say this because some of you don't fully understand how I come to this conclusion, but some of the places that I have been, the experiences that I've had in life, if, if you place any one of us in those predicaments, <laughs> you are going to be surprised at what you become. Any one of you, I don't care how loving and sweet and educated you are, if we place you in the middle of hell, you're going to adapt. You're going to adapt. It's going to change you. And, and, and one of the things that people have, um, have allowed themselves, and especially now because the Bible says more than ever we become lovers of ourselves, we just allow ourselves to just give place to what we want and what we feel, so much so, the ridiculous um, uh, point, so much so that some people don't even know what they are anymore. Whether they're an animal or a human or a male or a female or no gender or, you know, and people have all these things done to change their bodies to look like leopards and tigers. And, and it's like, well, what's going on here? What's happening here? We're just allowing the flesh to control us. And God has put things in place to stop that, baffles, if you will, to kind of stop the flow of that. And, and Lucifer, above all else, above all else, he was created in a way that no one else was, given a position that no one else had. And clearly, it, ba it, it didn't backfire on God. God knew what was going to happen. But Lucifer didn't know what was going to happen, that he exalted himself. He thought more of himself than he should. And so as a result now, this rebellion in heaven takes place, right? And he convinces, I don't know how Lucifer convinced a third of the angels to, to, to take up sides against God. I don't know how you do that, but Lucifer did it. And so while God gives you the right to make choices and decisions, and you know that it is true, don't over-spiritualize this because you can walk in love or not. You can choose to hurt people with your, with your words or not. You, so I prefer that you would build one another up, but sometimes people are tearing each other down because it makes them feel better. You know, we have the right to choose whether or not we're faithful to our spouse. We have the right to choose what we put before our eyes. We have the, come on, it's the truth, you know that. We have the right to choose these things. Here's the, here's the deal. The consequences are going to be worse than you could possibly have imagined. And so now we have a nut job waging war against innocent people, right? Well, how did this happen? It's called self. It's called self-governance, self-exaltation, self-promoting. It's called pride. It's called arrogance. A little bit of influence from the devil. Somebody who is not born again, who is not yielding to the Spirit of God, who is not filled with the Spirit of God. Now you're just a puppet or a pawn, Right? And, and, and so the consequences were swift. The consequences were, I mean, forever and forever. But here's what happened, is that the nature or the characteristic of Lucifer, whatever it is that he did by his rebellion and by his self-exalting himself, now it causes all of man to be in the same predicament as, as Lucifer. Um, full of pride, full of arrogance, full of self. And, and every one of us has that bent or, or we're prone towards self. Unless you have something to help you, unless you have something to offset that, you too will travel down a selfish road. You too will do things that are self-serving and selfish. Unless you overcome that. And as Chief Lewis and I have talked about, you all have an internal default in, in a moment of, uh, say for example, a fire. 
okay, you're in a public building and a fire breaks out, your internal default is set to panic. And the like, most likely, every one of you, you're all going to head for one main exit, and there'll be a pile up at the door, and not everybody will be able to get out. So that internal default has to be overcome through training and discipline. And some of the training and some of the disciplines that some of us have acquired when we go into a public facility is we look for secondary egress, tertiary or third. Uh, so you have a main uh, exit, you have a secondary exit, a third. You're always looking to say, okay, if something were to go down in this room while I'm in here, everybody's heading for one door. Guess where I'm going? I'm going out that one. And then once we loosen, uh, cast the devil out of that door, that door will... <laughs> Because that door's locked up, man. So you come in, you say, listen, if something goes down in here, I'm heading out that way or I'm heading out this way because the rest of them are going that way. That's what you do. But it takes training and discipline to get to that place. Now, you don't, you don't always have to worry about it, obviously, because the, the Lord will, will help you in these, in these matters. But some of us actually think this way out in public places. Training and discipline. The internal default, the internal default of the internal default of every man that is born, every woman that is born is self. You just leave kids alone in a room and you see what happens. Mine, mine, mine. I want this, I want that. And you have to train and discipline them to share, to be kind. Now, some kids are more kind and loving than others, right? And, and so we have found in, in the times that we're living in, it's important for you to remember that unless something drastically changes in the heart of man, man is heading down a, a road called self. And what, what it will do is it'll cause wars to take place. It, it, it'll cause people to hurt one another, uh, to deceive one another, um, to turn on each other. So what's the best solution? What's the remedy here? Man needs to repent and be born again. With, straight across the board, I don't care who you are or where you find yourself, that is still the remedy, repentance and to have the born again experience. That's it. So that ought to tell you what your focus should be. Well, shouldn't we be doing more for these people over there? Well, I don't know what you think you're going to do. I mean, if, if, if you pray... But if nothing else, this should encourage you that, wow, we really have to keep working toward bringing people to repentance and preaching this gospel, because that's the remedy for everything. I mean, I'm, I'm just assuming Putin ain't born again, I'm just because he ain't acting like he's born again. I'm just assuming. I don't see how anybody could be born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and be doing the things that he's doing. And what he's doing is simply this. It's just like you going over to your neighbor's house saying, hey, I want your house, I want your stuff, and I'm taking it. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the, the long and short of it. And so now, because of the fall of man, because of what took place in the garden, those who reject God's remedy and solution um, are, are rejecting their only hope because the inclination of the heart is only and always wicked and evil. And it's taking you down a road called self and it will put you in hell ultimately is where you'll end up with the devil. Because there are only, according to the scripture, there are only two families on the planet. The family of God and the family of Satan or Lucifer. And the only way to get out of the devil's family, because you're all born into it, you know that, right? You're all born into the devil's family. The only way to get out of that is to be born again and to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and to make him your Lord and Savior. God does this wonderful work in you, puts to death the old man or old woman that you were. You were connected to sin, connected to failure, connected to sickness, puts that person to death, and now a brand new creation exists. Now you're connected to love and peace and light and good. But you have to renew your mind to this. You have to be properly taught. You, you have to under, understand that if you don't actively grow and develop in your faith, you will still act the same old way. Because you can have heaven in your heart, but hell in your head, and your head will win out. And so here, clearly, we see um, this, this attitude of the heart called pride or arrogance uh, the, the greatest example of pride and arrogance is Lucifer. 
That's your primary, that is your, that is your greatest example. And so, unless you have been born again, unless you have been filled with the Spirit, unless you are staying filled with the Spirit, unless you are renewing your mind, unless you are crucifying every day your flesh, unless you are developing new habits and new disciplines, you too are going to travel down a road called self, and it's going to cause more problems than you want. How many marriages have, have ended because of selfishness, of self-centeredness? How, how many people are miserable and unhappy because they keep catering to self? How many nations are in a predicament that they're in because of self? I want to be the one in charge here. I got a throne, but it ain't enough. I want more. Well, yes, of course, you can have the world. I got the world on a string. And we've done ourselves much harm. And, and so I wanted to show you um, an example again. I think we, for those of you who haven't heard and haven't, uh, weren't here Wednesday and you haven't listened to it, I want to show you this incredible example of pride and arrogance in action. I just showed you Lucifer, how he got booted out of heaven, okay? But he had a throne. He was in the garden. It wasn't enough for him. Do you know anybody like that where it's just not enough? I'm better. I don't need this. I don't need you. I don't need to submit to you. I don't need to have anybody over me because I'm better. Well, that's arrogance, my friend. That's pride. And the Bible says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And God has given us checks and balances to keep you on the straight and narrow because the inclination of the heart is always wicked and evil. Always. I mean, listen, I disagree with the person. Oh, people are basically good. No, they're not. They're basically evil. Scripture tells us that people are not basically good. They are basically evil. Well, you know, you have to trust in humanity. I don't trust humanity for nothing. Do you? I don't even trust most Christians. Because I know that many Christians do not discipline their thought life. I don't want to know what goes on in that head of yours. Don't tell me either. Because, you know, it changes like the wind for some of us. You don't want to know what goes on in my head either. Here's the thing. It's none of my business what goes on in your head. And truthfully, what you think of me is none of my business either. That's, that's your sanctuary up there. It's your, it's your torture chamber or it's a refuge. Right here. Right here. This is a torture chamber or a refuge. And, and, and what I hope to do is I hope to get you thinking differently and speaking differently and acting differently because if you just go by how you feel all the time, if I went by how I felt this morning, I would still be in bed. You have to, you have to rise up and say, no, no, you don't. There are times when you should stay in bed and there are times when you, you have to act a certain way. But here... here Life is full of things that just are difficult and hard. And, and we can't just continue to cater to the flesh because then your flesh is just going to be like, okay, oh, you don't want to go work out today? I know you had a rough night. It's okay, sleep in. Well, then a day turns into a week, turns into a month, turns into a quarter, turns into another year. And then come January, you're making another New Year's resolution. You're going to work out more this year <laughs> and eat better. I'm telling you, you just have to discipline yourself and start walking it out. It's the same with spiritual things. And over in Numbers 16, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, I'm going to show you that these people... Now keep in mind, Lucifer had a throne. You're going to go to Numbers 16. Lucifer had a throne. We're only going to look at three verses here. <coughs> Lucifer had a position... Lucifer had a throne, Lucifer had responsibility, and it wasn't enough for him. And one thing I, I want to say before we move on, it's 11 o'clock, we've got plenty of time. If a rebellious uprising could take place in heaven, if a rebellious uprising did take place in heaven, with God as the leader, with God as the overseer, why are we surprised to see rebellious uprisings taking place everywhere else? It should be no surprise. This thing with Putin ain't no surprise. Well, what did you think was going to happen? You think you could trust him? 
Now, here in Numbers, you know that the Jews or the, Israel, the Israelites are God's chosen people, correct? And you know that God raised up, this is going to be important for you, you know that God raised up who to lead them out of Egyptian bondage? Moses. Moses did not want the job. Moses tried to get out of the job. God chose Moses. How come? Don't know. Ask him. There are things that I don't know and I don't need to know. I just know that God chose Moses. And Moses didn't want to do it, but yet, you know, I, my people, I want to, you know, let my people go, Pharaoh. Let my people go. And Moses, you just do what I'm, I'm asking you to do. And so, you know the story how the Israelites, all they did was murmur and complain. And chief, I think what I want to do is I want to look at verses 1, 2, and 3 from the New Living, please. The New Living. The New Living. And I'll read it to you from the New Living, okay? One day Korah, son of Izhar, a descendant of Kohath, son of Levi, conspired with Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, from the tribe of Reuben. Verse 2. They incited a rebellion against Moses, along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly. Verse 3. They united against Moses and Aaron, and they said, You have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? Wow, who does that sound like? Right? <coughs> they are acting just like Lucifer. And they were right. God was with them. God set us all apart. He is with all of us. We've all been set apart. Who the heck do you think you are acting like you're greater than the rest of the Lord's people? You are all the Lord's people. I am not greater or any better than anybody else. Moses is no better and no greater than anybody else. Moses was simply chosen and designated by the Lord to lead these people out. That's it. Period. End of discussion. Now, in any organization, like I said, God has established some checks and balances. He's placed some things in place, some, some, some uh, buffers or, or barriers, or when you, when you go bowling and they, they pop up those rails so it keeps the ball from going in the gutter. That's what God has done in a sense, is he's created a way for you to stay on the straight and narrow so that your ball doesn't land, you, uh, land in the gutter. And so what we find happening, and, and, and we have one more passage of Scripture we're going to go to in the New Testament. What we find happening here is that abs absolutely, absolutely, we're all God's people. Absolutely, God loves us all. Um, he's not playing any favorites. But how do you get 250 people to rise up against God's chosen? The same way Lucifer got a third of the angels to rise up. The same way a third of the angels in God's heaven, under God's watchful care and eye, because people have the right to choose. And in your heart, within the heart of man, it is desperately wicked. You know that it is, it's always going to take you on a path called self. Unless you overcome or override that internal default with the word and spirit with disciplines, with the disciplines that God provides. Church is one of those disciplines. You cannot successfully live a Christian life without this. And if you think that you can, you are one of the ones who is full of pride and arrogance. And you can tell them I said that. Who? The person you're thinking of. <laughs> I don't know how else to tell people this, that this is not a burden. This is not something that is, that is outdated. Um, we haven't progressed out of this. We are still in the church age. And Jesus said, listen, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but continue to keep coming and so much the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Not less, but you have to do it more. So for the ones who think that this is not necessary and that it's okay to stop coming and not be a part of it, you have put yourself in a very bad spot. That's right. Well, we're all God's people. Yeah. We all have the Spirit of God. Yep. Yeah. I can hear from God and fellowship with God at home. Yep. 
I can hear, you know what? I hear from God in fellowship in the bathroom. How about you? Can you do that too? Yes, you can. How about on the golf course? Yep. How about on the football field? Yep. The, the beautiful thing is wherever you are, you can fellowship and have intimacy with your Lord and Savior. Because God is everywhere and God lives in you. But he's put this together, he's assembled this together for your benefit. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll conclude with this. Yes, we're all God's children. Those of us who have been born again. We all have the Spirit of God. I don't have any need for anybody to teach me. Well, that's not exactly right. That's a misrepresentation of the Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4. If a rebellious uprising took place in heaven, if it took place with the Israelites, it can be taking place in your own heart and mind. A rebellion taking place in your own heart and mind, a rebellion taking place in your own home, a rebellion taking place in your office. Listen, here's the thing. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing or not doing. It just matters what you're doing. Sometimes you just have to snap people out of it and say, how ridiculous you sound. Well, this is the trend. This is where we are today. Besides, the church has gone off in a ditch. You ain't never going to find no perfect church this side of heaven. Amen. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 4, we reference this, and this is important, because now more than ever, now more than ever, Christians need to understand the basics of discipline, of, of how we can do this successfully and keep from being duped and deceived in, in the in times in which we find ourselves. Deception is on the rise. False teachers and false prophets are on the rise. And you are not the false teacher popo. So get that out of your head. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, Jesus, gave, um, he, he gave gifts unto men in verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, this is verse 8 of Ephesians 4, he led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men. Verse 11 tells you what those gifts are. You ready? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now I find that I'm in a place in my life and in ministry right now where I have to say something. These, this, this is what we call the five-fold ministry. I, if you look at the screen, he gave some apostles, number one. He gave some prophets, number two. He gave some evangelists, number three. And pastors and teachers goes together. So really, I say five-fold ministry because there are five distinct gifts mentioned there. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Right? So let's just go with that and not get caught up in the technicality here. Let's just say there are five gifts that Jesus gave to who? To men. To us. He didn't give them in heaven. He gave them here while we're here. He gave them to us here while we're here. Think, I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I, I haven't been there. I, I, I assume you haven't either. I mean, if you have and you have some insight, I would like to hear it. But I've not been to heaven, so I can't tell you. I don't know what it's like. We have loved ones that have gone on and, and moved to heaven. If they could get a word back to us, I'd love to hear it. But I've asked God for that and I ain't got it yet. So I'm not asking him no more. Because I'm interested and I'm curious. I want to know what really does happen. You know, what are they doing right now? Um, are they thinking about us? I don't know. Mm, you know, praise the Lord. We know that the scripture says that they root for us and cheer us on in our race now because we're still running our race, but they have crossed over. But here there are five specific ministry gifts. The Bible and King Jimmy, he gave some, not all. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, these people, because ministry gifts are placed within people, these people are no better than you and me. We're all God's children. We're all God's people. We all have the Spirit of God in us. We all can sit at the feet of Jesus in fellowship and have intimacy with him wherever we are. But these five specific groups have been given the assignment by the Lord Jesus, the head of the church, to do verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until, verse 13, until we all come in the unity 
of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect manner and of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The New Living says these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So by reading this then in the New Living, their responsibility, I'm sorry, Chief, New Living, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. You can't accomplish that without these five. And if you can, then you are mistaken and you are full of pride and arrogance. I'm just being honest with you guys. I just have to be honest with you and tell you. If you think that you've arrived at a place where you don't need these gifts and you don't need this, you are on a path to destruction. So you are self-destructing. Now, what does that look like? And I don't know. It probably looks different for everybody. I don't know what it looks like. I was on that path. And I'm not going to lie to you. I was. I don't need nobody. I got an anointing of God on my life. Man, I fellowship with God. Man, I pray in them tongues. I lay hands. I don't need nobody. I ain't got nobody. Yeah, I got, I got people that God has placed in my life so that I can learn how to receive from them and submit myself if necessary. See, the trouble with this job of pastoring is that people get to a place where they ain't going to talk to you. They don't want to hear from you. Don't go knocking on the door. They ain't going to talk to you. They're going to leave. They ain't even going to say goodbye. And you think, well, pastor, why don't you go after them? Because I'm not going after them because it's too late. The best thing that you can do is stay connected and stay engaged so that you don't drift too far out there. Well, the, the, the Bible says he leaves the 90 and 9. Well, don't, don't misunderstand that one either now. The sheep, the, 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 the pastor or the shepherd who follows after the sheep gets uh, his shoes soiled. You're supposed to follow the leader. And you're supposed to keep yourself in the love of God. I know the ones I have to go after and try to rescue when it's not too late. The ones, the ones who have crossed that line, I just say, you know what, Lord, they're in your hands. I'm here. I'm here. But I have to keep driving this bus with you on it. Okay. So, without these five full ministry gifts, then, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that in order, in order for you to, to be equipped to do the work and to be built up, you need these five full ministry gifts. Thank God for the five full ministry gifts. Thank God for them. Just like Moses, and I'm not going to toot my own horn, I won't do that. But just like Moses, I tried every, I, I did not want this job. And, and we tried every which way um, to not serve as a pastor. I wanted to just be, in fact, I went to Bible college just so that I could get some knowledge and some information so that I could go help serve a man of God in a church body somewhere. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back and do that uh, in Connecticut. And then when that didn't work, then I tried to convince God to let me go to Indianapolis. There was a pastor in a church out there, and he said, he flat said no to me and Valerie separately when we were praying in different parts of this uh, place where we were staying. And, uh, and I didn't want this, and Valerie even said she's not going to be married to a pastor, and I didn't blame her. Who the heck wants to be a pastor anyway? You must be at your mind. But here's the thing. When God calls you to a specific role and function, it's not the job of the other sheep to judge and criticize or to rise up in rebellion. Church splits come from that, you know that? Church splits happen. And, and here, here's, here's uh, something that Paul said in, in, in his letter to the Corinthians. You know, for this reason, many are sick and weakly, and many die prematurely because you don't discern the Lord's body properly. We are the Lord's body. This is a, this is an, uh, 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 a local church fellowship, but we are a part of the universal body. And when we hurt one another and when we deprive one another of ourselves, of our supply of the Spirit, that's not discerning the Lord's body because we are not going to operate in, or fire on all cylinders if our key members aren't coming. Mm. Mm. You had to say that, huh? Well, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. I mean, I think you want me to tell you the truth, right? You don't think I know the difference when our members who are refusing to come, you don't think I can feel the difference in here? Like, I know that there's something spectacular and wonderful just waiting. 
and, and we got to fire on all cylinders to get there. But when we pull back and we go sightseeing and we, we take an alternate course or we quote unquote church shop, which is nothing more than church hopping, get somewhere and land there and stay there. And just say, okay, Lord, how do, how do I help? How do I help? How do I get involved? What do I do? And no, you ain't running me off. And no, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. No, I'm not going to take offense. I'm here. And if God calls you elsewhere, that's wonderful. But guess what? God's not going to hide that from your pastor either. When he calls you to do something else and go somewhere else, God's not going to hide it from me because I have oversight of you. I said this to you before. There's things that I know about you that you probably would be shocked and you're like, who told you? <laughs> you did. By your actions, by your words, by your behavior. You told me all about yourself. And some things I just know because I love you and I'm here to watch over you and I understand about you. So learn the balance. Understand, and, and this is just to, to kind of recap so that you understand what I'm trying to convey here. Learn that there is a balance in life. Learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. But unless you have developed disciplines and unless you've, over, you've been able to develop some patterns and habits and disciplines, you have an internal default, an internal default sent to, set to self. Every one of you. That's not an insult. That's not to criticize you. That's just to tell you, folks, that's just the way we are. It's an internal default set to self. And if you want to overcome that, if you want to override that, then you need the fivefold ministry gifts. You need the assembling of yourselves together. You need the word of God. You need the spirit of God. And you definitely need to learn how to say no to yourself. Because you need to be here. I'm telling you, that's just the way that it is. As we move into uh, an unprecedented future, because we are the last day, we are the last hour, we are the final minute church. As we move into this time of, of, of being at the very end of the end, um, it's going to require that you stay the course more than ever. And, and understand, and I'm sorry to take you just another minute, understand of those five gifts, only one of them is the shepherd or overseer, and that's the pastor. It's not the, not the apostle, not the prophet, not the evangelist, not the teacher. It's the one that is uh, symbolized by the ring finger because he's married to the church. That's your shepherd and overseer. So if you're going to need a word from God, don't go calling the dial a prophet or, or, or dial an apostle. You know, say, Lord, I, I need to hear from you. Go to church. You have an appointment. Bless you. You have an appointment with your pastor on Sundays and Wednesdays. Go to church. You'll hear from God. Amen. Amen.